everyone. I'm Ed Keebler from Rottler Manufacturing. This is Lake Speed from Total Seal. This is Don Miller, our absolute resident expert on carbide and, and uh, cutting speeds and such. Don's been uh, grinding carbide for over 40 years and inserts for 30 years. So he has a vast knowledge of inserts, speeds, and feeds. And we're going to try to give you some grassroots information today that may help you in your shop, help you make more money, help you save some money on insert costs and such. You can definitely and, do that. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. And so we're just going to get this thing started. This is just going to be a conversation between us, and, and, and we're going to pick on Don more than, than anybody. Um, I know a little bit about it. I'm kind of a seat-of-the-pants guy. I know nothing about it other than what I experience in my life so I got lots of questions yep. okay great <laughs> you know I'm a I'm a see the pants guy I was taught by my instructor 47 years ago to look at the chip if it's straw colored it's good if it's blue it's too you're too much feed or speed mm. and if you're not reaching straw color you're not getting the optimum out of it so uh, we'll just start talking a little bit about different inserts and, and different materials and and some of the challenges that, that uh, you all may have uh, during the machining process so uh, I got a dumb question to start this off with. Perfect. Okay, as this the, the newbie, you know, novice kind of guy when it comes to it, for someone that doesn't know anything, that's new to the automotive industry, one of the things I think that may come across first is you can have aluminum box, you can have iron box, you can have aluminum heads and iron heads. Well, why can't you just cut them with the same inserts and the same feeds and same speeds? Yeah. Why does that metallurgy well, make a difference? That difference is the number one difference. And by the way, thanks for inviting me today, Ed and Lake. Nice, it's a pleasure being here, and it's exciting. Okay, so, but a very good question, and and that is that's something that you know the industry always has been trying to get better and better at is the different applications of the, of the different carbide, other different coatings, and and the geometries of how to do it. So you got all different kinds of surface finish you mm -hmm. want. You got different hardnesses, so all that's taken into factor when carbide's being built and pressed nowadays. So they're getting better and better and better with the pressing processes and doing the geometry to, to go that route. You just can't use one insert for one specific thing. What? Yes. One size doesn't fit all. No. <laughs> Not Anyone who knows me already knew I was going to say that, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. So, so talk a little bit specifically. What makes aluminum cutting metalworking? Different, different than cast iron or other steel. The cast is much softer, you know that, and the mm -hmm. aluminum is soft too. But the amount of edge that you put in, the amount of chip load that you actually put on to the to the insert to mm -hmm. the holder, will will come off different. So, like Ed says, you got to look at that chip as it's coming off. Do those recommended speed feeds. You know, get up in front of it, take a look at that insert even before you use it. Right, look at it and see what the quality of the edge is. Make sure it's good. Then use that insert. Go in there and use those recommended speeds and feeds. Go in, get back out, take the time to look at that insert. What the effect did it put onto the insert? What effect did your finish do? That's how you get to your speeds and feeds in an accurate way. And, and look at that edge quality. See if that coating's breaking down? That tells you what your speeds and feeds are doing. That's where right. it really helps you is to be able to watch it and do it often. Make sure that 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 chip loads coming off property and you're finished. So, so Don, you talk about uh, uh, edge. Look at your edge and, and, and what's happening. I, I'm a novice. Like I said, I'm a seat of the pants guy. You're, you're a, 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 a true expert when it comes to these inserts and things. What are we looking for when you look at an edge of, a, of an insert? What are you looking you're for? You're looking for that good quality. You're looking for a nice, smooth wear. You're, you're looking to see if that, that the coating, if it's a coated insert, mm -hmm. if it's starting to pull away, you know, or if it's opening up the edge, and you might be forcing that insert in there too fast, or you might be too slow, and you, that's where you got to pick up your speed. But that's the knowledge you got to gain as you're doing the process, you know, to make it sure your holder is properly placed in, the inserts properly locking in, and everything right to make sure it's all coming together. You said cutting too slow. Cutting too slow. We never say cutting too slow, right? <laughs> right. But is that the cost that you pay for? It? You know, sometimes if you're going too fast, right, and you use your wear your edge up, did you get the value out of that insert? Okay. So if you're cutting too slow, sometimes you're cutting too slow when you're not putting the chip load on. 
So you got to pick that up so that chip loop comes off of that. Okay. So it forms off of the, the insert, and, and you get a better finish. And you, you get you, sometimes you don't want to put in too far, but you don't want to put too less. So, so Cody Lux and the Three Bears strikes again. <laughs> not too fast, not, not too, too slow, slow, just right. And you read your chip to be able to tell whether or not you're generating the proper amount of heat. So, so Don, you you, uh, you talked a little bit and, and you mentioned chip load. And and um, I get customers constantly telling me, well, I'm you know I don't want to burn this I don't want to burn this insert up. Yep. So I only take a thousandths per pass. But in reality, no. that, that that's the wrong thing no, to do. No, it's actually the wrong thing to do. You want to see what your total tolerances are, right? You want to see how much stock you're coming in and coming out with. And go into that volume. You know, take that good load, go in there 15, 20 thousand, and pull that chip out. Watch that come. But yeah, sometimes when you're coming in too less and you don't have, you know, enough stock in there and you're just buffing the edges, you're not getting a good chip pull, the, the, the insert is not doing the proper work. You've got to put that insert to work. So finding that value, using those recommended speeds and feeds and starting there, then work your way forward and backwards until you get that ultimate for the machine that you're in. So uh, another question that I've always had is, is does the chip actually help pull heat from the insert? Yes, it does. Of course it does. Yes. So that's another reason to make sure that you have that enough load chip load. That's right. And then, then, then your end feed comes in too. So to make sure that end feed's coming off and continuing to the next cut, to the next cut, to the next cut. That chip pulls that heat away from there and then lets you go. Okay. All right. That's pretty cool. So back to metallurgy. What, what would be some basic guidance for people who are, don't know anything if I'm cutting aluminum versus, say, compacted graphite, and it's right. much, what, what, how would you approach that in terms of just kind of general guidance? You, you got to you got to use your manuals, your knowledge, and everything. Okay. That, everything. That, I mean, the internet's very popular for that. And get yeah. down there and do your homework, right? You you got to go in there and look and see exactly what type of material you're using, what's recommended. Mm -hmm. um, the industry has really been uh, aggressive on making so many different types. Okay. to improve, you know, through metallurgy. But you need to know what your commons are and then go with your values and get that information to make sure you're buying the proper insert, buying, buying the proper grade, the base grade, buying your coating. So to do your end job, these guys are very good at, at explaining all that to you. And their they're information's out there. Get it in the people's hands. Okay. Get it in your own hands. I mean, sharing that information is what, what really makes the cutting in the industry push that much harder to do it right. So in the automotive industry, Don, you know, we're pretty, we, we I don't want to say we have blinders on, but we lock in on certain things. And typically when we're surfacing uh, a cylinder head yeah. or a block, we're using two types of inserts. We're using what we call a PCD, polycrystal and diamond, yeah. or CBN, yeah. which is cubic boron nitride. And can you explain a little bit about the characteristics between the two? Because typically we use PCDs on aluminum only. Yep. Uh, cast iron tends to tear it up. CBN, you can use kind of a combo. But again, I've always heard that the oxides in the aluminum will tend to prematurely wear the, the edge of the CBN because of the oxides. Uh, and and that, that's where it's a hard choice. But yeah, the CBNs were more they'll adhere to it. If you get the heat too much up on it, then you start collecting too much uh, resin, on, on metal resin on, on the edge, or yeah. the cutting edge. Built up edge, right? Built up on the edge. You yep. see yeah. that? You yeah. see that. And very the common. chip's not coming off. It's just going to hang on to there, you know. So that's where you got to pick that speed up maybe a little bit and, and get on through there because you're not getting that chip off of it. Okay, so if you have chip build up on an edge, that then just obviously not the you know, it, it's not the end all, but the common practice would be would be to speed up a little bit to try to get that chip away from that edge That's right. faster, so it doesn't, it doesn't tend to weld to the edge. That's right. And I guess weld is not a good term. No, it, it is though. It's what it is. It does it here. It yeah, does it, 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 it is. The cutting edge and makes that that crystal and then holds that on. Um, cleaning that, you know, getting that. That's a very expensive insert, so you want to make sure that you know that you're using that properly. So if, I, if I'm not wrong, I interrupt, but that's the whole idea of having the coating that's right. on the tool. Is it's basically a dry film lubricant it to is. try to prevent that adhesion yes. of the 
what you're cutting sticking to the, the tool sticking edge. to the tool well, edge. Well, another thing the industry does too is a post coat too. Like that, that coating's on there, they'll actually go back in there and remove some of that coating so that when you make that first cut, that first pass, you know, that coating is not there and holding you up because sometimes too much coating on there will adhere and make it worse. So they call it a post cone. They'll actually remove some, they'll put the coating on and then remove some of the coating. You know, otherwise they found this out by people using it, and as they the more they used it, the better the answer got, the better answer they got. Okay. So, okay. so they, they said, hey, bro, let's remove some of that coating, let's get back to that cutting edge and put it properly there. You know, so that's a whole lot of it um, as far as far as the CBN and the cutting. So, so I have another one, and, and you being a oil guy, yep. okay, as a background, I get customers that use ham cooking spray, WD-40, <laughs> beeswax, everything imaginable, uh, right? anything and everything you can imagine that might have any type of lubricity or uh -huh. lubrication properties, they use it. Don. Fill us in. Is well, that, is that, is that <laughs> really you know, every, everybody's got their own way of doing things, you know, yeah. so sometimes you can't take the belief out of another. But your, your, your coolant's got to be proper, too. That's something mm -hmm. you really got to check. Make sure your coolant's proper. Make sure your coolant level is there, you know, because there's the lubrication in there. The good things are in there to help cool that tool and lift that lubrication. So if you if you talk to these companies that provide that type of coolants, you know, which is all different kinds, right? Work with them and they'll work with you, and then you get that really good flow of lubrication along with protection of the cutting edge, and cooling that cutting edge, getting into that chip, putting it in the right place, and making sure that cone's going on the right spot. So, so, what about in a dry application, Don? You know, because most of the surfacers in today's yeah, world, yeah. we've gotten away from grinding and we've gone to CBN or PCDs, and so. Most of the machines aren't capable of uh, applying coolant. They, they could, we can put misters on right, them yeah. and, and mist some some you can that on that. On and get, Yeah, you can you can use that operation. But most of that dry dry cutting and stuff, you really got that spindle speed up. You know, you really got it going through there, and, and that's the effectiveness. You'll actually see that chip blowing across there, and then throwing tons of chips really quick on the nose. Okay. Okay. So okay. On your dry lines, and that's there's no. It, it's get through there and get it done. Okay, and that's so where everybody puts the load on. So, so if, if again, if we're just generalizing mm -hmm. in a dry application like that, speed is king. Speed is king. It, okay, it is the one that's and, the way they go. And, and is it is it when we talk about speed? What let's define? Is it RPM or is it feed rate? It, it's both. You actually get the RPMs up as high as you can get them in a lot of applications. Okay, when they're coming across there, and then and then you just drive through, and you can feel and you can see the results as it comes. You know, and take that least pass, get that get that down in there, then make that tool work and watch it. Work. Okay, and you can see that chip coming off. You might even see, you know, on some applications, you'll see some sparks, not on a little of course, but <laughs> on your other heads, you're, you're going to see that spark come up, and don't be afraid of that. I mean, a lot of inserts really work in the dry. And that's really the industry's pushing in that direction. So what uh, I'm just novice here, right? Yeah. Being around shops my whole life, though, would you say that most people who are dry machining are doing it too slow, probably? Probably. I would say about 90%. All right, so I, that's kind of my thing is like, what you're saying is yeah. the tool you is see. so much better now yeah. than it was 20 yeah. years ago yeah. that people are still running 20 years ago feeds and speeds, yeah, I see but the that. tool is made to go supercharging. And, and that's and that's what's hard to really get somebody's mind to say, wow, you want me to do what? Yeah, oh, oh, right. listen, I'm already here on that. You know, I can already hear my dad. We like, have talking about this. Like, no, you can't do that. That's R&D, though. That's research and development. You're doing it yourself every day you use that tool, right? You pick that thing on, and you've got to find out where the limits are. Right. The only way you're going to know for your equipment, your machine, is to get in there and do it. Even if you have to mock it up, play with it. Just like welding, learning how to yeah. do anything like that. Go in there and see if that tool can really do it. You don't really want to do it on your best, you know, your final cross. But get out there, have fun with it. Well, it's interesting because I'm thinking about back to my dad in the shop. We, we got a mill, and yeah. we were working on some stuff a couple years ago, and he was, you know, having some issues with the surface finish and all that. And we, he got a mister, and we set up, we started misting, and man, it got a whole lot better. Sure. But I bet now I'm thinking we were misting because we weren't going fast enough, actually. Exactly. If you don't probably put that on, you then got it. How about that? And you bring up an excellent point. You, you were talking about, you know, 
uh, trials and, and, and you know, make it fun and, and, and try these things and check it before you get to your final yeah. finish uh, for your machine. Machines, machines make a huge difference. The rigidity also, of a machine is everything. The rigidity of your tool is everything. You've got to have that rigidity or you're going to get that bad thing. Your tool's got to be tight. You know, yeah. you got to make sure your cartridge is clean, your tangs are clean. Everything's got to be just right. And that's your PMs, right? Take care of your machine, the machine takes care of you. So yeah. take that time. You know, check that coolant. Do that stuff. Then get in there and have some fun. You know, see what that tool can do. Find the, find a little bit. Well, you said checking the coolant. Yeah, that's it's, a, it's a big it's thing huge. that a lot of people miss, right? People I mean, that, and oil guy, so I am a metalworking fluid specialist as well. Is it if you don't have that refractometer, if that's not that's your it. best buddy, you know right where it is right now and how to use it, then you need to start using it because that's the number one thing people miss is that's right. the rate of evaporation, but also having filters, maintaining it. Your contaminations, you got to change that coolant. Yes. Get it in there. It doesn't last forever. No, Do you hear does. that? It right. does. Clean coolant it does not out. last forever. You need to make sure that your coolant is in proper working order because it's one of the things in the application that you got. And stronger concentration is not always not, better. No, not <laughs> More is not better. Man, not it sounds always. like I've heard this story before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find out where that zone is on your refractometer. Hold to that area, you know, make sure, because like I said, contaminations you get in, you get machining oil and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's going to change your whole cutting of the tool. The right. effect of it could cause gathering and uh, uh, build up on the insert. I mean, and back to you said the type of insert and its compatibility with the coolant. Not all coolants are compatible with every Correct. type of right. insert. You're talking about CBNs. Right. You have to be careful because there can be leaching uh, of the boron from it that can right. cause it. Basically, it can come yeah. apart. It, it, it just it's disintegrates. Right. right. So that's yep. really key to know. If you're going to be using CBNs, talk to whoever your your coolant supplier is to make sure the type of coolant you have is compatible with that CBN insert. So that it can do the job that it's supposed to do, because right, right. and they, they are fantastic. Yes, sure they are. Yes. It, they so, revolutionized the automotive industry, really. Yeah. The CBN insert has. Yeah, there's a lot of lot of rings and bores and you know, uh, and piston ring. I mean, piston stops. It's just like mm -hmm. right. That that came in and did a huge increase in the in the automotive industry because you could hold that tight twine, it's like 50 millions in in that ring. So that ring was fitting in there properly, made engines much much better. Just Think about how they used to do it on Bridgeport, you know, and then when the CNC revolution come, you know, how much tighter the tolerance. Much that's why these that's why these motors are lasting longer. Right. Because the tolerance is the CNCs and these operators can hold with all the technology and the inserts has really helped our industry and, and make this stuff a lot better. The quality is just phenomenal. It's a perfect example, yeah. The I mean just the piston ring, it's it's a seal and it the, the tighter we can hold that tolerance, the flatter the straighter it can be. The better, better the seal can be. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And that's efficiency and that's longevity. They, they, they go hand in hand. It's not like you have to trade one for the other. Yep. Okay. Now, a lot of things in life you got to trade off here or there. This thing, there's no trade off. Like, yep. I get better ring seal, I get better durability. Yep. yep. Yes. So, so Don, another an, another thing that I run across all the time in this business is, is you know, we talk about uh, cutting inserts and the radius is on those cutting inserts. And as a general rule of thumb, and again, I'm the seat of the pants guy. This is the, the expert. You know, I always tell customers, the sharper the insert, the less tool pressure you're putting on the part. And so if I have a thin wall cylinder that I need to, to bore, instead of using maybe a 32nd radius insert, I'll use a 16th, uh, 16th radius insert. Okay. And, or I'm sorry, 64th, I'm, I'm backwards here. I'll use a 64th radius insert, 15 thousandths radius, yep. uh, to reduce tool pressures. The, the one place I really find that makes a difference is when we're line boring on this machine. Mm. Uh, I always, I, I, I don't even recommend it. I require that you only use a 64th radius insert when we're line boring because I, it just seems to give me a better, rounder, straighter bore. But talk a little bit about uh, tool pressures. The tool pressures, you know, um, the radius is there to help hold some of that pressure. That, that sharp edge on the corner, when that radius is on there, it, it's supporting, it's putting all the strength as you're doing any of your pull. So when you're coming through and you're putting a cut on that edge, that edge got to roll over a little bit. So you're right. Pick up that radius size a little bit. Put a little more strength back into it. You know, because that sharp edge could, could fail on you, then, then you, you lost your edge. But anytime that radius is, is put on there and... and 
it helps just support everything underneath the putting range. Okay, so so the, the and again, I, I'm trying to generalize a little bit, but the larger the radius tends to strengthen the insert. Sure. It, it's a stronger insert. Sure. But you do put more tool pressure, tool pressure on, on the part. Yes, okay. to make that, to make okay. that support. That, that's great information. I, I just, you know, I, I learned something right there. So what about rake angles? How does that factor oh, in yeah. what we're doing? Well, of course, the rake angle, I mean, and, and every company's got their own, right? I mean, there's in the industry, everybody's looking at what rake to mm -hmm. put on. So um, it, it, the periphery, when the periphery is ground on the insert, the, the rake's got to be for the clearance so that when you're going through, that clearance opens up, right? You don't want it too steep because then you're, you're vulnerable to your cutting edge. You don't want it too shallow, you know, so you, you don't want to rub. So that rake angle is very important on how that's, that chip's going to lead off of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's a really good thing. And make sure that when you get that insert, that those rakes are where they're supposed to be. So does rake angle have any influence on what your ultimate feed and speed combination sure, is going to be? Sure, it's going to because it's just the vulnerability of that cutting edge. Got it. The higher rake you got, the more vulnerability you're going to have on your cutting edge. So, okay, so so like a, a high rake angle cutter, you would want to use an interrupted cut. I, I, that that's definitely probably not. You're going to you're going to actually fail. Probably it's going to it's going to it's not going to be able to hold up to the impact of in and out, in and out, in and out. Okay, all right. Um, Another thing, talk a little bit about positive rake versus negative rake. You know, in the automotive business, we run positive rake inserts for, for cylinder boring and negative rake inserts for cylinder boring. But uh, when it comes to the surfacing end of it, it tends to all be negative rake stuff. Yeah, the negative rake seems to be able to perform um, to, the, to the edge, to the quality of the edge, to, to help make that surface. Um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of companies go to the negative edge because the strength of that. Whenever you're going through and making the chip load, mm -hmm. um, so the negative edge is provided. So a lot more, a lot more. Of the industry has been going that way with the negative edge. I've noticed that. that uh, so that it's a strength, it's situation, a strength situation again. Situation with again. negative rake is a stronger. Sure. Uh, is a stronger For the application okay. of the cutting edge to the. Oh, well, that would make sense then, in a, especially in surfacing cylinder heads, because it's typically an interrupted cut. That is. So you, you need that strength, essentially, yeah. more mass, exactly. more strength to yeah. hold the, so it doesn't yeah. chip and break. Because when you're coming in and out of, you know, an in, right. interrupted cut, it's, 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 it's hard. hard. Yeah. 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 The negative rig is very. Yep. Okay. Very All right. Good. Now, where would you use a positive rig insert? I mean, is there, it's. Is there an advantage to either one? You know, I mean, we, we get customers constantly at Rottler. We, as, as I just said, you know, we make a positive rake uh, triangular insert. You get three edges on it. Right. We make a negative rake uh, insert that you get eight edges on because the, the negative rake stuff, you're able to uh, reverse the insert. Yes, in other words, you have, yeah, you have two over. surfaces on it, I should say. You get four, four, four or, or on CBN, you know, kind of the same thing. You're right. able to to use that 360 degree area and then roll it, or yeah. flip it over, not roll it over and, and use that. Yeah, and, that, and that's what's precious about that is, I mean, you get that quality that you can flip over, you get that extra edge because of the negative rake situation. On the positive edge, you know, you, you've only got that one side, you mount in and, that, and that's what you get. Um, but it depends on what operation that you're planning on perform with that, with that positive rake. I mean, mm -hmm. where would you go in at, at what speed, what speed? To help that insert make it better, so on the positive rate, that's the selection you have to make. Okay. All right. So one of the other things we do, you know, we talk about surface feet per minute all the mm -hmm. time, and and a lot of a lot of customers probably don't understand surface feet per minute. And Don and I were discussing that a little earlier in the before the presentation, and he said, you know, everybody kind of has their own formula, yep. own formula yeah, now. So, so typically when you get an insert, you know, most of the manufacturers will kind of recommend, recommend a, a surface feet per minute, but, you know, guys that, that maybe don't have a background in uh, machining kind of scratch your head and say, what the heck surface feet per minute, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, at Rottler, we have a, a little insert chart, that, that just the inserts that we sell, you know, and we kind of give you a definition of what they are, and we sort of tell you what the surface feet per minute would be, and there's a formula that you use when 
when when we say, well, we still don't understand what surface feet per minute is. So what we will do is, is you know, you take the RPM, and I believe you you take the surface feet per minute, and that's times 3.82, I think it is, divided by the diameter, and that will give you the RPM that you need to run your your uh, uh, cutter at. You know, and the diameter is is it's a 14 inch cutter, or a 10 inch cutter, or an 8 inch cutter. That that determines surface feet per minute. So. So we have that, you know, if, you're, you know, if anybody would want one of those, you can get on our website and, or, or call one of the call Rottler and just ask for one of our cutting insert uh, bulletins. And, and it lists all our cutters and kind of gives you the, the ability to, to transfer that information from surface feet per minute to the right RPM. So the amount of contact that the insert has in, in with the surface and, and how, how, many, how many revolutions. So keep that insert at work by having it into the surface and, you figure that and that seems to be the important point to is me is is that and again I, I, I this is in, in, in my experience this is probably the biggest wives tale that that I see in our industry is is guys feel that man they just paid two hundred dollars for that insert and they're gonna baby this baby yeah. they're gonna mm -hmm. make this thing last for a lifetime okay <laughs> and so I'm only gonna take a thousandth off or I'm I'm only gonna I'm gonna run it at a slow RPM, or I'm gonna you know I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna push it, and, and and it's really to the detriment of the insert it, it, and it, the machine and the machine and the machine and the rigidity, you know. Yep. So so that's that is what you got to do is to get that surface speed up. Uh, use it, use the formula, but don't be afraid to go a little higher. Don't be afraid to take that extra cut and put that tool to work. So how about? Uh, you know, we talk a little bit also, we, we have such a wide variety of things that we do here. You know, we, we bore mains, we bore cams, we bore lifter bores, we bore cylinders, we surface uh, uh, by metal. You, you know, and this is probably That's one of the tough, th isn't it? <laughs> this, is, this is probably one of the toughest aspects of the automotive industry is getting a good finish on a by metal block, Don. Uh, we, we fight that, and I know a lot of our customers fight that. Sure. And uh, do you have any rules of the road or, or expertise when, when we're trying to, you know, because what happens you, is... You, you is get into that aluminum, then you get into that steel, then you're, then you're blending it back into with your aluminum, back into your steel. And yes. You get that constant pattern. And you got all those holes in there, too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you got all them holes in there. <laughs> but, but, yeah, when you're making that cut, as you see, as it's coming through, it, it, you you got to make sure that you make the right pass. Do you go right down the middle on the first time? Do you pass on the outside? Where are you making your cut? How deep are you? Um, you know, put that load back on there again. But, yeah, as you're going through the metal, it's going to go into the... Uh, it wants to go into aluminum and, and take the chip with it. And that and that's where it's important for your speeds and feet, especially interrupted. When you're coming in, you're interrupting that chip. You're coming back out. And you got the holes. If you're opening it up again... Get that coolant in there. Get that chip out of there. Flood that thing. If you're if you're not doing uh, dry dry cutting, you just got to get in there and make that coolant work. Is there a is there a particular edge? Uh, negative rake, positive rake, sixty uh, fourth radius, thirty second radius. Everybody's going to give you a different application. Are they? On okay. Yeah, that, that's, okay. That's I R and D. I mean, that's what everybody you know. Everybody's got their own tool, and that's that's when you when you're searching around for different tools. You got to use the recommendations. Their R and D department looks at that and does that. That's what everybody should do. I mean, you need to look at that too. So, so your buddy that's using, you know, positive rake, sixty fourth yeah. inch, might be successful. But it doesn't mean it's going to work for you and your machine because you're a different tool supplier. You're buying your insert from exactly. So you, it, it too, there are apples on apples. Application. That's a great point. That's a great point. You know, you're. Your tool holder may be different than the other guy's tool holder, sure. or your boring bar, or your surface. You know, you may be running a 10-inch uh, diameter uh, fly cutter fly versus cutter. a 14-inch exactly. diameter fly cutter. So, so it's it's very uh, machine and job specific, yes. and there's no one size fits all. It's like every time we do these things, we start off like, oh, we're going to give you all these answers. We do is give you a lot of questions. We give you a lot of questions. Yeah, we give you a lot of questions to ask. But, you know, that's the thing. I will say, in my lifetime, the last 15 years especially, what I've learned is there's so much that you don't know. Right. Stuff that looks simple, that looks easy, there's more to it oh. than meets the eye. That's and it's what you don't know 
is what should scare you. Yes. When the good thing is, like you're saying, is you're not alone though. You can reach out to your tool That's supplier. Right. You can reach out to your you machine guy. You there are them. people you can go to yes. that will have the information you need. So the real thing is, what we're really giving you is what questions to ask. Within the yep. industry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they'll work for you. They'll work with you. Use that line. Use that information. Use that internet. Mm -hmm. You know, find out what you're doing. And uh, a lot of salesmen help you through. I mean, but then as they leave and they're doing something else, you still need that information. So... Call them up. They have support, many support, and their R&D is changing all the time. They'll, they'll work with you. They'll make sure you're doing the right thing. Okay. So uh, another question, Don, is this coded versus non-coded inserts. You know, yeah. and obviously we have CBN and PCD for for surfacing, but yeah. but uh, when we're boring cast iron or or we're boring aluminum and, and, and installing bronze uh, lifter bushings in there and, and things like that is is there and I probably already know this answer but is there a rule of thumb should you use a coated insert on a cast iron or should you use a, a non coated insert uh, sure I mean the coating is protecting that cutting edge right and that's why it's so that's all that, that that's, that's what that's the coating the really does yes that is the protection okay and that, and that, that is the key to it, to make sure that coating thickness is proper, right? Because mm -hmm. cause it, when it's in the uh, centering uh, as a coating, I mean, it's being adhered to all the inserts. So right. the, coating, the coating thicknesses play a big part of how much protection you got. So um, in the industry, make sure there's a level there of, of thicknesses that they'll make sure that they're put on their inserts. So, yeah, that coating is, is protecting that cutting edge as it goes in there and, and does it. It's extending the life of the cutting edge. So, yeah, that's what the coating selection. Um, there's so many different. Uh, you got your TIC, and of course, you got you know, all your different values of coating. So you need to make sure that you're looking at the manual. They'll tell you what you need and what coating they recommend. Okay, so I got a really dumb question here, uh, but but I see this happen all the time. Uh, Lake over here, you know, he's machining, and he happened to stumble across this gold insert. Oh my God! This Good thing one. works Go phenomenal. Ahead. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. And uh, Ed's over here, uh, maybe across the state or across the country, and I stumble across this black insert. And, oh man, it's phenomenal! Like you got to try this black insert. You got to try the gold one. Are you talking about black insert? Yeah. yeah. So, so I know in abrasives you can make an uh, like an aluminum oxide abrasive any color you want. Sure. Okay. On coatings. Do, do different colors specify different types of coating? Sure, and a lot of the companies will use that for an identifier, right? I mean, okay, they'll yeah. do a sub-coating and then come back with an oxidized coating and then come back in with a, like a TICN and coat back over top of it. A lot of it's for identification, but that double coating protection there is you can actually help see whenever the coating is starting to get through. Okay. Then that second, that second coating there is for the edge to help, help to adhere that coating to the carbide when the edge prep is being prepped before it's able to coat it. So they're doing a surface prep, you know, they're making sure that that surface is good and clean before the coating goes on. But they'll, they'll sometimes they'll apply two, two different types of coating. And then yeah, an edge yeah. to yeah. coating okay. to, to help it here. So, so is a gold coating a specific? Uh, um, they can use it at like a TICN, that, that's 45, yeah. that's, that's a gold coating. So a T Titanium, titanium aluminum, 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 aluminum titanium nitride, right? Yeah. Titanium nitride yeah. is a typical gold coat. That's correct. Yeah. And then a, a dark, a black uh, uh, is a. Yeah, you can have like C9s or dark grays. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a C9 type coating, but uh, that, that's more of the uh, aluminum stuff. On the aluminum side of the yeah. coating. The titanium okay. aluminum nitride, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. They're all BVD coatings, which yeah. we happen to know quite a bit about because we actually use those same type of coatings. Our piston rings. Our piston rings. rings. Yeah, because it's the same thing. Just it, it, just like the coating protects and provides that dry film lubricant right. on the tool to uh, to reduce friction and in increase productivity, it also protects the ring and also helps it to live better and longer. So you have a better material, longer lasting. The the PVD coatings are phenomenal. I mean, it, it, they have revolutionized so, the, the automotive industry, sure. uh, not only in machining. But also from wrist pins to valves and piston rings, it's it's they do great things. Coatings are good; they're yep. your friend. So, one of the last questions that I have is: is 
chip breaker versus non-chip breaker. Um, you know, when I'm, I've always been taught, and, and I'm not saying this is right again. So, so you're you're the expert. I'm asking yeah, this I've... question for for the for the for the viewers. Um, I've always been taught in cast iron, you really don't want a chip breaker. It's an unnecessary part of an insert for cast iron because obviously cast iron doesn't throw a, you know, it's no. not a curly chip. It's a, it's just a, it's a it very, powderized. It's a powder. It, yeah, it perfect. Just, exactly. it yeah, powderized. Fine grain. It goes into a yeah. fine grain. And yeah, really, I mean, why would you need a chip breaker on that? Um, going yeah. into a cast iron situation, I mean, that powder just, it, I mean, a mill, I mean, right. it cuts yeah. very nice. I mean, so yeah, I don't understand. Like a lot of guys will look to uh, a chip breaker on a, a cast iron, and you know I don't know if it's just their specific their specific uh, choice, but I don't see why why chip breakers are used in, in softer metals. In, in softer metals. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So so about right. aluminum, something like that that's really soft, right? right. They, yeah, they exactly. I mean, you want that edge up. You know, want that edge up on that. You know, you got that soft cut. You want to go in there and get the job done. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, just don't see the chip breaker effect on that where you're going into putting that chip load down into that chip breaker. You want to just keep that up on top and, and just pour it right out, mill it right out. And, 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 and when you talk about that, that, that see, I'm, I'm, I'm intently listening there. When you talk about that chip breaker and you're talking about what, what really happens is, is that that chip actually goes yeah, down into that slot and then rolls up and it, and it breaks the chip. And, and in aluminum, I think you were talking about, uh, I don't want to say up short, but, but, but uh, explain a little bit about it. Well, as the chip breaker, the chip breaker's use is to break that chip off. Right. So chip handling, right? So you, you, you want to get that chip down in the machine. Mm -hmm. You don't want the spirals. You don't want so easy clean out. So a lot of chip breaking, the only reason a lot of it is, is for chip handling. Okay. okay. In, in the cast iron operation, you don't need that because... Okay. So I'm going to do it anyway. But you want to make that chip small. You want to make it safe. You don't want stringers. You don't. That's the reason geometry is being used to a lot of a lot of people have been cut by stringers. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. If you, but on a lathe, you, you exactly. experienced it. You had a bar. You reached in there and scooped them out. You school of hard knocks yeah, here. There you, you go. Know, when you're young machine. and dumb and Stop don't know what you're doing. Get those out if you're getting that. They look really cool until so they I, 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 can, I can grab that and break that off. Yeah. Ah, you know? uh, yeah. It doesn't work too well. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. But that's a lot of the reason the geometries are formed to these days, you know, that they take the time to figure out where that chip is coming off. And handling, chip handling, I mean, when you get taking the load back out. You, you want to get them out of there, you want to handle them easily, get them to the bend for the recycle, and you know, it takes less time to clean your machine that way. So a lot of chip breaking is for that reason, for that reason to chip in. Lesson learned, lesson learned. So Don, we've talked a lot about surfacing and boring and that sort of thing. And, 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 and you know, we also make equipment where we're uh, porting aluminum cylinder heads and, and you know, actually making parts from billet and 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 uh, things like that is there, and, and this is where we could really help our customers because again, they're, they're maybe not as well connected or, or don't have the resources to to research some of that stuff. Is there is there any just kind of basic rule of thumbs you can give? I mean, I, I understand. Or, internet, or trusted internet resources. How about or, that? Or, yeah, or trusted internet resources. That's a great, great. Yes, yeah. great catch. Yes. Uh, you know, I know we make what we call lollipop cutters, which is just a round sure. ball cutter, um, and and there's ones for aluminum and cast iron, and and uh, also uh, 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 CG mm -hmm. uh, yep. uh, uh, graphite, yep. compacted graphite. Yeah, form milling is getting very very popular, and everybody's starting to get unique with it. Okay, uh, a lot of different type cutters are coming out now, um, the end ball mills and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Where, where the programming is so exciting anymore. I mean, the, the 3D programming and what, what what they're able to do with the equipment with all the axes is just phenomenal for the art that we they do. You know, the formal used to be everything was round or flat. Or, now the contouring is coming into business, and they're getting that that cutter to do the forms that everybody right. likes to do. A lot of selections, a lot of lot of a uh, lot of work, a lot of contour to do that. What tool to make that form? So I see that big. It's really big right now as far as coming industry is going to be using that more and more and more. Okay. All right. Um, 
and, and then that brings up another question that I have. And, and again, you know, we're in the automotive business, and, and so we see the aluminums and the cast irons and some bronze, and, and there's more and more of the compacted graphite. Yeah, uh, CG's showing up. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the blocks and all. And obviously, you know, I, I've been to several seminars and cutting tool seminars and all, and, and I see these massive boring bars that maybe have, 10 indexable cutters on them for cutting uh, CG or compacted graphite. Now, now, obviously, our customers, they're not doing enough of that to, to be able to justify a, a boring bar that's, I don't know, 10, 15, 20,000 right. dollars for one cutting tool. Right. Um, so if we had a rule of thumb and, and a, a guy's got one of our F69s or, a, or an EM69 HP or something like that, and He's been doing aluminum and cast iron, and you know, guy blows in with a set of CG heads or a, a CG block. Is there a rule of thumb that they can get by with with a, maybe a single point? You know, or, or typically, typically we either use a single or a, or a dual cutter in our in our cylinder bores. And, and again, I'm I'm running from the seat of my pants here. I have nothing to base this on, but I've always been told that you'll leave the feed rate where it's at, you'll cut your RPM in half. So if I'm running 900 revolutions per, or, or, or uh, uh, 900 RPM, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and on a cast iron block, it's say six thousandths a revolution yep. feed rate, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to leave my feed rate at six thousandths a revolution, but I'm going to go to 450 on my RPM. And, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong or indifferent. I'm, I'm kind of asking you, lead me or, or give me some information there. Yeah, well, that, as you pull that, that RPM back down, I mean, the amount of feed that you're going to go into, you're going to change that feed rate, right? Right. So so as you cut down that feed, you expect a, a better pull off of that. So you're, you're trying to blend to that uh, the difference. Um, Two loads on the on the on the, the cutter and the holder, okay, and the insert too, okay. So you're making that decision of backing that down. That, that's what what you have to do it if you don't have the other applications to do the bigger stuff. Yeah, the big complaint is is if they run the 900 RPMs, it just burns the tools. Right. You know, they get they get an edge per cylinder. Exactly, and and so all that. so by slowing the RPM slow down. That back down. Because that's harder material. It's harder material. Yeah, right, so, yeah. Right, right, right. So, yeah. good rule of thumb would be, you know, leave your feed rate up, and keep the yeah. chip load there, yep. but slow your RPM. I'll slow down. your RPM down. Don't let that, that insert work in there and get it in and get out. Okay. So, so kind of you go fast on soft stuff and go slower on hard stuff. Hard, hard yeah. 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 Okay. Great. So back to my trusted internet resources comment. Is there a place that you feel confident in? based on your experience and knowledge level, that someone that's curious about this, that wants to read up more, could go to and be able to elevate their understanding a little bit. Yeah, I mean, all, all, of, all of the major industry uh, insert builders have okay. that site. And go there, yeah. They're, yeah go, go, go to the company website. websites. Yeah, yeah, go to those company websites. Look at those applications, because it's all that information is in there, and that's all good information. Uh, there are indeed development and, and their resources Put a lot of information on the on the web, and, and that's that's really where to go. Okay. The applications is all out there. Everybody's seen these videos and and, and studying them. Like it's wow, you know. And yeah. That's why you make these things to help each other. Right. And that that's what's why these this equipment is built the way it is, and we share that information of what you're doing with it and what the application is. That's that's everything. Just get out there and look in there. It's very easy. It's very friendly. Um, great sites. Uh, and the geometry that they're 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 coming up with on the inserts and development the R and D's is it's just phenomenal for the future coming up too. So, if you were going to look into that camera and recommend to our our uh, customers and and anybody interested in this, the tools that you would need to to really look at the inserts and the edges. Number one, obviously, is is your internet trusted resource, sure. okay? Sure. What would number two be? Uh, possibly a good uh, 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 microscope, microscope or, 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 sure. 
high, high power loop or something like that. Exactly. I, I highly recommend a good power uh, microscope. Again, look at those cutting edges. You know, study them before you even use them. As you're using them, study again. See what the effects is on that speed and that feed that you're putting to it. That's what the R&D labs do too. Mm -hmm. They look at that chip coming off and they watch the chip. They measure that chip. They'll save some over here. At this speed and feed, that's what I got. But another pile over here, as you increase your speeds and feeds, study them. Took, take them under, put them under the microscope. You'll learn about the different, the hay colors, the blue colors. That's how you do it. And then that's how you get better. You know what those tools do. So as you get a new piece of tooling, they're going to recommend, but take the time to do it yourself. That's the second thing. That's, that's great information. So. Is there a brand name uh, microscope or something that, that we could give to our listeners? Or do you just go over into your child, your children's bedroom and snag their microscope that they were using uh, to, to look at lugs and, and different things with and, and take it to the shop? Let's not forget, we have all these new devices now called cell phones. And wow. let's not, I mean, don't think that it can't do what it can do because look at it. Never thought uh, of that. Use like your that. cell phone. I mean, it only takes a minute to do that. It's better if you have a scope. You can study a little better. But use that stuff. I mean, you have one available. Take that time. Take a picture. Take a picture of your chips. You know, so you use the devices that we have nowadays. You, you don't have to go out and buy a big fancy one. Right. You right. can use the kids. Uh, right. Kinda, yep, they can look at bugs and you can look at chips. You can look I, at I can already know what I'm doing when I get home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daughter's my awesome. Yep. Yep. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time. Ed, yes. any final questions or thoughts before we close uh, it up? I can't think no. any. I just want to thank Don for, for thank taking time out of his busy schedule to come over here and educate us. Thanks for uh, having So uh, really enjoyed it, Don. Appreciate thank it. you very much. Really thank you, sir. Thanks Appreciate you. it. And back to you, Joe. What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.